here. Honored to be with all of you guys. Uh, local church pastors are my heroes. And the work that you're doing in your city and your church, you're doing a good job. Keep going. And uh, in fact, I want to encourage you around that a little bit. If you get your Bibles out, Ephesians, turn over to Ephesians 4. And then um, get ready to take some notes. We always say at our, at our church, note takers are history makers. Yeah. And uh, lean in a little bit to the, to the message. I got a lot of content. If you know anything about me, you know that I like lists. And so I got a list and I got a lot of points and a lot of thoughts. And I'm going to take us to, to the end where we're going to have a little prayer uh, for the church and prayer for, for, for pastors and leaders on our way out. Um, I did this message originally with our staff at an all staff meeting um, last year. And I, I noticed and felt like our team, like every team, was starting to get a little discouraged, a little fatigued. Uh, you know, 2020 was the hardest year ever in ministry, no doubt about it. If you're in ministry, you know it was just, it was tough. And I felt like there was a little bit of, um, on our team, a little fatigue in many, in many ways, but watching people who they love sort of self-sabotage on Facebook. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And, and watching people come and go and just, um, you know, it was just a challenging season. And I felt like the Lord told me to um, sort of reawaken everybody's heart for the church. A part of our responsibility is, you know, not just preaching and leading and having church, but helping people have a high regard for his church. The church. We have the opportunity to lead the church and to be a part of the church around the world. So I did this, I did this message and it was just, I felt like it was just a great injection and the team was like, you gotta do this, you gotta do this on the weekend. And so it turned into a couple of weekends, a little mini series that I did in our church. And I, I'm real simple, I'm just gonna call it the power of the church. The power of the church. And if, if there's anything that I hope to do in the next 25 minutes is just, um, you know, just to get us to turn our eyes back on the beauty and the magnificence and the incredible, um, you know, the, the strength of the church, the local church, which is the hope of the world. And you know, God's plan and God's strategy hasn't changed. The local church is still the tool in God's hand for the redemption of this earth. Come on, do you believe it? So let me just encourage you a little bit. Okay, real simple. Let me just remind you out of that, out of that little two-part series that we did uh, in our church, we, we kind of came out of it with this little, this little mantra that I really want you to get. Maybe you can put that on the, on the screen for me, everybody. This world needs the church. Yeah. Does anybody believe that that's true today? Yeah. This world right now, the world we're living in. Needs the church like never before. How about the next one? How about the next one? Your community needs your church. Like what would happen today if you closed the doors of your church? What kind of impact would it have on the community? Your community needs, needs your church. And then let's make it personal. Your church needs you. Your church needs you. We reminded our, 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 our church of these three things over and over again for those few weeks. And uh, it just kind of it just kind of caught on a little bit and got everybody re-inspired about the church. So here we go. You ready? I'm going to give you ten things about the church. Just the next couple of minutes. Then we're going to we're going to pray. We're going to worship again uh, uh, for a minute on our, our way out, everybody. And so here we go. Number one, the church is God's idea. God always has a people. Even in the Old Testament, they were called the congregation. Jesus said what? Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. You know, all throughout scripture, it's called God's house. Jesus said it is my church. So guess what? It's not your church. It's not my church. It's not John's church. It's his church. And isn't it amazing that we get to put our hands on it and we get to to lead it and we get to be a part of it and we have this great privilege but at the end of the day it's his it belongs to him and it was his idea come on the church is God's idea how about number two the church was born in the supernatural the book of Acts chapter 2 when was the last time you read Acts chapter 2 verse 1 
They were all together on the day of Pentecost, all in one accord. And suddenly there was this sound like the blowing of, of, a, of a violent wind. And they saw what appeared to be tongues of fire. How many of you know that was a moment? Yeah. Think about this. This was the origin of the church. When I was in Bible school, uh, one of my Bible school teachers said, if you want to know God's intention about anything, go back to when it was first mentioned, original mention, when it was first talked about in scripture. So if you want to know God's intention about the church, go back to Acts chapter two. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls and the church is born. And this fisherman, this ordinary guy named Peter, who had been with Jesus, I think that's the miracle of Pentecost, by the way, that Peter stands up and he, he takes an Old Testament uh, a, a scripture and he brings it into New Testament context and 3,000 people are born again and the church is birthed. That's the, that's the origin of the church. The church was born in the supernatural. Come on, Holy Spirit, fire falling, everyone speaking in tongues, 3,000 people are saved. All that on one day and the church exploded. How about this one? Number three, the church is built on the supernatural. If it's born in the supernatural, it's built on the supernatural. I love what Charlotte talked about, the, the work that needs to be done. And so much of that work is behind the scenes. It's praying, it's fasting, it's crying out to God. It's weeping, it's working through your own pain and working through your own, your own situations. And, and, you know, sometimes I think we're trying to build something that is supernatural, we're trying to build it with natural means. And we're trying to build it in our own strength. The preaching of the word is supernatural. Worship is supernatural. Now we have all this technology and we have all these, you know, these tools and all these different things that help us, but it's all, it's all supernatural, reaching the lost and, 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 and prayer. All of these are supernatural things. And I'm afraid so often that we're, we're so focused on, on the natural and we're so focused on everything being perfect and everything being right that sometimes we miss the edge of the supernatural. Paul said it this way. He said, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Wow, think about that. Paul's saying the church is built. It was born in the supernatural. It's built on the, the supernatural. I'll tell you one way to heat up the supernatural moving of the Holy Spirit in your church is prayer. It's fasting. It's reading the word uh, uh, on your own and pulling away for a couple of days and getting into a, getting into a zone where you're seeking God, where you're, you're bringing those, those desires and those things that are in your heart about the future. You're bringing them to the Lord. You're pulling away from all of the natural uh, uh, pressures and all of the natural distractions. Come on, everybody. Somebody say supernatural. supernatural. How about this one? Number four, the church is guided by godly but imperfect pastors. Sometimes we have to remind everybody that we're not perfect. Sometimes we try to act like we're perfect, like we got everything together. We have this incredible trust that's been given to us as pastors to lead God's house. Yet we know our own imperfections and our own insecurities and our own challenges. And Paul said it this way, Christ himself gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity of the faith. Godly, but imperfect pastors. So what's our job? Our job is to equip. Our job is to put into the hands of the people that are a part of our church the tools that they need to serve his church. We're, we're to equip, we're to get people ready. We're like the equipment manager on the team, the football team. We make sure everybody gets what they need so that they know how to play the game, so that they know how to do what they're called to do. Uh, that's our job. Our job is to equip and our work, listen to me everybody, our work is done in the heart. It's hard work because the job that we do is done in, in people's hearts. It's not just about imparting knowledge but it's about, it's about the heart. So we're having to get down into situations that are difficult to talk about and help people with issues of the heart. And it's painful sometimes. It's, pain, it's painful for them, it's, it's painful for us because of their response or what they say. And, 
Sometimes it's a thankless job what we're called to do, of course, but we do it because we believe in the church, because we love the church, and because we're called to the church, and because the church is God's hand here on earth to reach our community. Let me, let me remind you, this world needs the church. So we're called to equip. The equipping that we do is in, is in the heart, and every Christian needs a pastor. And we have to remind people, don't we? Everyone needs a pastor. I need a pastor. How many of you know? We all need one. Sometimes we ask, who's your pastor? To other pastors. Because sometimes pastors are are out on their own. Sometimes it's pastors who are like sheep without a shepherd, disconnected. If you're, if you're here today and you're looking for you know, a place to connect, you, you found the right place, Art, so many friendships, so many relationships, not like you have to connect with a certain person, but you find your, you find your, your tribe and you find your flow and you, you get in and you get connected and you connect with someone. You, you need, everybody needs a pastor. Pastors need pastors, right, everybody? Number five, the church is built by godly but imperfect people. So, so the church is guided by godly but imperfect pastors, but it's, it's built by godly but imperfect people. We know that. Ephesians 4 says, if you keep going, um, 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 and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and, and that we may become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. This is our work. Our work now is, is rebuilding in many ways. I love we're all kind of talking about where the church is right now. Some people are experiencing, you know, we're, we're, we're almost, you know, almost everybody has returned. Like Texas. Come on, how many of you know Texas is unto itself, right? <laughs> they're having full services in Texas. Uh, they're like COVID what? You know, they're, they're, you know, California is a different story all different parts of the country. Um, and we're all in this place of rebuilding. You think about Nehemiah and what Nehemiah was called to do. He was called to rebuild something that was once amazing, had, had, had fallen apart a little bit, but had to be rebuilt. And so what, what, what was Nehemiah's strategy besides, you know, downloading God's heart and getting the authority and the, the provision from the king? You read that story, it's pretty amazing. Uh, his His... His greatest strategy was he got everybody building the wall right in front of their house. The, the greatest thing that you and I can do is what we've always done, is get people serving, recruit people back into church, have opportunities for people to take next steps, join a team, and get involved. It's what we've always done. And we gotta do it again. And we got to do it again, and we got to do it again, and we got to do it again. We got to have the next steps in place. We got to have the classes going. We got to plug people onto the teams, and then we do it all over again. And it's awesome. It's beautiful. It's the work of the church. Let me just remind you, it's amazing. We don't, we don't apologize for asking people to serve. We, we don't apologize for making great demands of people. Listen, we're giving people the opportunity to do one of the greatest things they can ever do, and that's build the house of God. And we got that opportunity right now, right ahead of us. Listen, don't apologize. It's the church the amazing house of God. And God's gonna bring people in and put people in the right place. And we give them the tools they need and say, hey, just build this part of the wall right in front of your house. Imperfect people, nobody's looking for perfect people. We can't fall back on the, the age when the pastor did everything. We can't fall back to that. It's a new day. And there's a new army that God is raising up. And I, I just, you know what I felt? Uh, early this morning, just to, just to, to encourage you, don't lose your confidence and your boldness in this season, even though the church may have taken a hit, even though there may be, there may be a, 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 a little feeling that you have that, you know, we've kind of sort of taken a step back. Listen, no, no, no. Don't lose your confidence and your boldness about your dream and about where you're going and about what God has called you to build. Don't, don't lose it. 
Don't lose it right now. How about number six? The church has stood the test of time. A year ago, or, or, or so, a little, maybe a little less than a year ago, I was um, in Boston, and I walked by this church that um, it, it, it was 350 years old. I looked at the plaque again, and I thought, that can't be right. You know, I'm thinking to myself, you know, that, that's older than our country. But it, it's, it's true. I looked it up. This church, 350 years old. It's older than the, the, the Constitution. It's older than, you know, sometimes we think, you know, we, we, we place everything in the context of America and, you know, where we are right now. But I want to remind you, the church is 2,000 years old. Acts chapter 2 was like 30 AD. That's when the church was born. On that amazing day. And here we are. We're still going. And it's like 1990 years later. The church has stood the test of time. Wars. Famine. Pandemics. Come on. All of it. All the politics you can think of. Countries being born, countries falling apart. The church has stood wow. through every single season and every era. It's the church of Jesus Christ. So people say this is the worst season in the history of our country. But is it? Is it the worst season in the history of our country? Is it? Probably not. I think there have been worse times. Hello? I mean, we feel it because we're living in this, this time, but probably not. And even today, the church stands. I mean, look around the room. 20 locations, largest art, art uh, gathering that we've ever had. I think that's unbelievable. In fact, I think we ought to thank God that we're all connected together like this one day. Bunch of people watching online. Come on, the church has stood the test of time. That tells me it's going to continue to stand the test of time. Hello, everybody. We're going to make it through this. We're going to get on the other side. How about number seven? Can we talk about this for a moment? The church is about unity within community. If there's anything that's been under attack, it's this sense of community that we desperately need as people. And it's the call of the church. It's why we have small groups, right? It's why we have service teams. It's, it's why we gather together like this because we, we, we need community and we need to experience life together. We're not meant to experience life on our own. We're, we're meant to experience life together. And as we, as we come together, we're, we're meant to look down the aisle and see people that look different than us. Their, their skin color, their age, socioeconomic status, like that's the picture of the church and that, that we can come together like that, look, look at all sort of different ways and yet there's still a unity among us, not because of our sameness, but because of the Jesus that is down on the inside of us. That, that's why at the beginning of Ephesians chapter four, Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life Worthy of the calling you have received. Listen to this, uh, pastors. Be completely humble and, and gentle and, and be patient. Bearing with one another. And make every effort. Come on, somebody say, make every effort. That means it's going to be hard work to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body, one Spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called. Come on, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Somebody asked me a couple of months ago, how does it feel to have a diverse church now? Tough. <laughs> it's hard. But it's God's, it's God's way. It's what God has in mind. To have a diverse community, have a diverse body of believers, different skin color. Come on, are you with me? This is God's heart. We fight for it and we stay with it and we walk in it together. So, so, so we, we don't say, um, you know, that, that unity is, is, is uniformity. No, no, it's, it's, it's unity within diversity. 
that we can be different and we can look different and yet we can have the same spirit and we can have the same language and we pray to the same Jesus. Come on. So listen, keep fighting for diversity. Keep fighting for diversity. It's God's heart. It's God's plan. Is it easy? No. No. Harder than ever. But that makes it worth it. Get in there and roll up your sleeves and fight for it. How about number eight? The church is a place of refuge for hurting people. Yes, it is. That, that means it needs to be a strong place. Part of our culture, part of our church culture, every single one of us, our churches, part of that culture that we need to have a strong, it needs, it needs to feel, you need to feel strength when you come in. Right? Here's what it says. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. So that means, that means we have to be strong enough as a church to bear up under the failings of, of people as they come into our church with their own agenda, with their own, with their own issues, with their own pain. We have to be strong enough to have a strong place to help those that, that, that aren't strong, which means we, we, can't afford to, we can't afford to get offended ourselves. If we do get hurt, if we do get offended, we can't hold on to it long. We gotta, we gotta release it pretty quickly so we can get right back in to helping people. That means we gotta help our staff, we gotta help our, our team, we gotta help our leaders to be thick-skinned, to, to, to not, not take it personally and, 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 and don't allow insults to, to cause them to, to, to be you know, divided and, and to have strife. And, and we gotta help people learn how to be strong and, and forgive people when they say really nasty things. People get on social media and say things and, and man, there's all kind of division and all kind of things that are going, we, we, we have to be strong in the middle of all that. We, we can't be weak. We, we can't be soft. We, we can't, um, you know, we can't be so easily offended. We got to let it bounce. Oh, that's all right. I love you anyway. You know, we got to let it, we got to let it bounce right off of us because we have a commission and we have a work to do that's greater than a particular season or, or a particular political party or And so, so what about you? I, I feel like I meet a lot of pastors who are, who are offended and who are hurting and they're carrying hurt. What about you? Are you carrying hurt? You got to let go of that hurt. Some of the people that have left your church because you didn't do enough or because you did too much, <laughs> they're going to come back. They're going to come back and you need to be ready when they come back. You need to welcome them back. Not like I told you so, welcome back, but, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like, like really spiritually, you've forgiven them and you're in a good place and you can, you can, welcome, you can welcome them back home. And that means you, you got to deal with your hurt. Love what Chris talked about. What a stellar message. You got to deal with your pain because we all deal with pain. We got to deal with pain the right way. I wrote down a couple of thoughts. Uh, um, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds, healing their pain and comforting their sorrow. That's the Lord. That's Psalm 147. That's the Lord who does that. So, so you, you get this vision of being healed. Then you keep your soul in shape. That's your, your, your mind and your emotions. And your, then, then you're, forgiver, you're a forgiver. You're releasing people and you're not, you're not holding things against people. You're letting, you're letting, people, you're letting, you're letting it go. You're overlooking insults. And then, and then you're building these godly relationships. You know, think about Dino and that thought of 31 years of friendship. You know, that, that means something. That means a lot. That, that, those, are the, those are the friendships that are forged in the middle of really difficult seasons and challenges and, and, and even challenging each other and picking each other back up and pushing each other pushing each other and confronting each other, whatever that means. But we have these, we have these relationships that we've got to, we got to, you got to tend to, you got to respond to, you got to be there. You build those relationships and, and you know, some people look and say, well, I wish, I wish, you know, God would do that for me. And he is doing that for you. You just maybe can't see it right now, but it's like the day to day and the every day and the every season that you're walking with, you know, these divine relationships 
And you look up and you're like, wow, I'm in this community of friends and I'm in this community of faith and we're really, really all like each other and we're watching out for each other. Man, it's kind of hard you know, have you ever been in one of those crowds, like a concert crowd, where it was so, you were so packed in, you, you kind of felt like you could like lift your feet off the ground and you wouldn't fall. It's like, that's what it's like to be in a strong community of faith and friendship. And we can't just preach it to people and ask people to get in life groups and to get involved in, in, in life with other people and not do it ourselves. It could be the very thing that saves us in the midst of our most difficult season that we're packed in with the right people. Come on. Number nine, the church is a place of growth and development and thriving. It's gotta be. We, we have to continue to have a place where we challenge people to move forward. Discipleship, leadership development. It has to be a goal when people come into our church that they feel challenged to take another step. That they feel challenged to get off the sideline and get in the game and start serving. Come on, again, let's not lose our confidence. Let's go home bold. Let's go home forming new teams that get people plugged in and getting people involved because that's the church. The righteous, the Bible says, Psalm 92, they thrive like a palm tree and grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they thrive in the courts of our Lord. The God has put this, this is amazing, this mystery in place where the, 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 the local church has this, it's like a soil that has these ingredients in it. So no, one, no matter who you are, anyone gets planted in that, in that environment that hard outer shell of the seed breaks down because of the, the environment of the soil and they spring forth and, and new life springs forth. That's the power of the local church. We have this amazing opportunity to lead this kind of organization that's, that's, that's alive and organic and impacting people's lives. It's a place of growth. It's a place of development. It's a place of thriving, even when you don't feel like it is. And we've all left services where we wondered, man, I wonder if anything good happened today, you know? And then you hear, you, you, somebody will send you a text or you'll hear about it next week, so-and-so was there. and they, they, they raise their hand and they pray to salvation prayer. And you're like, whoa, God did do something. God's always moving. It's his church. And then number 10, everybody, I'm gonna finish right here. The church is a place where lost people can find Jesus. It's old school, it's evangelism, it's reaching the lost. It's taking a moment at the end of every service, taking a moment just to quickly share the gospel, Jesus came and he came for you. And he walked this earth and even though he was tempted in every way, he didn't give in to that temptation. He became a perfect sacrifice and he went to that cross just for you. His blood was shed. And he was laid in a tomb that was not his own. On the third day, he was raised from the dead. And the Lord, the Lord says, and scripture says that if you believe that story, you may not fully understand it, but if you believe that story, and if you pray a prayer of faith, God writes your name in heaven and your life will never be the same. You tell that story every week and then you ask people to respond and you'll be amazed. Every week people will respond to that message. That's the church. It's a place where the lost can find Jesus. I was thinking just about the last couple of weeks for us, um, just the last two weekends in church, we've had 372 salvations in, in church just the last couple of weekends, which is amazing. I mean, that's awesome. That's awesome. Let's stay, let's stay with the, let's stay with the cause. Let's stay with the mission. There's a lot of people out there that don't know Jesus. There's a lot of people that don't have a living, active relationship with Jesus. And we lead his house. And we get the opportunity every week to swing open those doors and let, let you know, humanity come in who are searching and broken and, and, and hopeless. And, and we share a message and we give an opportunity for them to respond. What an incredible opportunity. What an incredible calling that we have. The church is a place where lost people can find Jesus. Listen to this last verse, Mark 2, 17. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Every weekend, we're opening our doors. Every weekend, come on, we get to lead the greatest cause on earth, the local church.